Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which for the last four months has been in virtual mode. But we have been trying to do in virtual mode what we were doing in the real world. And one of the things that worked best for us in the real world was what we called our Sustainable Finance for Breakfast series. I don't know if you're watching this over breakfast, but this is now our Sustainable Finance Review very much the same kind of uh, material as we were looking at on a monthly basis in the real world. Our host or our, our, our anchor is Ben Caldicott, the founding director of the Oxford Sustainable Finance Programme and an associate professor at the Smiths at Oxford Smith School. Uh, he has many, many other roles. He's a member of the UK's Green Finance Task Force. He co-chairs the uh, Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment. He has a DPhil in economic geography from Oxford. Backing him up this month are Pippa Gawley, uh, the uh, founder and director of Zero Carbon Capital, a clean tech investor in both the US and the UK, uh, with a history of impact investing in San Francisco, a member of various angel investor networks, formerly at eBay, began at Capital One. Uh, she's a, a Cambridge graduate, Cambridge and, and Stanford. Chris Faint, uh, the head of a head of division at the Bank of England, where he is uh, the head of the bank's climate hub, and on the PRA's uh, supervisory uh, responsible for the PRA supervisory statement on climate risk. He was formerly private secretary to the deputy governor, and uh, was for, spent some time at EY. I'm going to give um, Pippa and Chris a chance just to say what they're up to in their day roles, and then we will move on to uh, to Ben's agenda with Chris and Pippa adding whatever they want to if he if they agree with him, if they disagree with him, if they think he's missed something. So first of all, I give you Pippa Gawley. Pippa. Hi, um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, yeah, so I'm Pippa Gawley. I'm the founder and director of Zero Carbon Capital. And I'm also an angel investor in the clean tech space. Started in California and now back over here. And um, we've, I've recently set up a seed stage fund to support uh, hard science companies attempting to tackle climate change with uh, technology innovation. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to joining, uh, joining this group today very, uh, and, and learning from, from all of your work. Chris, what, what are you and the bank up to? Hello. Well, firstly, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, so my name is Chris Faint. Um, as, you, as you said, I have a couple of different hats, but one of my hats is to look after the Bank of England's climate strategy. Um, we have a climate hub that sits in my, sits in my area that does a number of different things. Um, but I think the largest amount of work is focused on understanding climate risks and making sure that climate risks are understood by the firms that we supervise, but also the broader economy, working domestically and internationally to, to do that. And the two biggest things that we've got at the moment is working with banks and insurers to make sure that they understand the climate risks that they are exposed to. Um, and also doing, um, I think, the world's uh, first bottom-up stress test of the uh, UK system to look at climate risks, which will launch next year. So we're just developing that. Excellent. Ben, what have you been up to? What are, what are your concerns working through your agenda? I give you Ben Caldicott. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And wonderful to see Pippa and Chris. Um, busy month. I guess the last time we came together was 18th of June. Lots of things have been going on. What I thought I would do is start off with some central banking supervisory things, um, and we could explore those with Chris, and then we'll move on to some other topics, because it's been a, another busy month on that front. So firstly, um, the Bank of England published its own climate-related financial disclosure. Um, and I think this is the first time a central bank has done that. This is a commitment that was made in 2019. Um, and I think the thing that was interesting for me, I'd love to get Chris's view on this, was the... Um, the analysis of the portfolio warming potential of its balance sheet. Um, and this is obviously something that there's a very active conversation about how financial institutions should be measuring the warming potential of their portfolios and their, their loan books. Um, and so the bank did this for its corporate um, portfolio, 
corporate bonds, corporate bond portfolio. Didn't do it for its government holdings, which of course make up the bulk of its balance sheet. But um, but Chris, maybe you want to comment on on that. Chris, bit. Chris, indeed. Yeah. So so the bank, the bank of England has been saying to firms, you need to understand what's going on with your balance sheet. You need to understand the risks that you're exposed to. And as part of that, um, we're saying that um, banks should do TCFD disclosure. They should be open about um, the types of exposure they've got so um, external viewers and investors can, can see that. We've put our money where our mouth is and we've done this ourselves. And as Ben said, um, this, is the, this is the first time that any central bank anywhere in the world has done analysis on such a broad scale. Some other central banks have done it on, on smaller parts of their portfolio. So this is a first. And to be totally honest, you know, because it's a first, um, it was quite tricky to do because um, uh, the, the science isn't all there and the data is not all there. So um, we've made a lot of assumptions, but we've put it out. Um, and um, and there's a couple of things that I would draw out from that. The first one is the the headline the headline numbers that Ben has alluded to. Um, of the Bank of England's total portfolio, um, about two percent of it is corp- is in corporate bonds, and the rest of it is in government gilts. So we've got this kind of strange dynamic where actually the Bank of England's uh, climate risk is anchored to that of the UK's uh, climate risk. So as the UK transitions to net zero um, by 2050, hopefully the Bank of England's uh, exposure to climate risk through its holdings of gilts will also also reduce. Um, so so the, large, the large part of the book is, uh, is linked to that. But as Ben said, we've got 10 billion um, uh, pounds worth invested in corporate corporate bonds. And the, the investment is done across the whole of the market. So we don't distinguish between whether a firm is green, whether a firm is brown. It's just uh, for macro potential, sorry, for, for, for macroeconomic purposes, we just, we just stood by it across the whole of the, the market. Now, there is a big debate as to whether that is the right thing or, or, or not to do. And Andrew Bailey, the governor, has said he's going to investigate um, whether we can change that over time in conjunction with the, the Treasury. But, but when you look at the, the warming potential of that corporate bond portfolio, it is greater than 3%. So it's saying that by uh, 2100, it will be significantly above the Paris, Paris goals. So, so what we will do as the Bank of England is we'll say, well, look, you know, we've now done this analysis. We've, we've got it here. That is something for us to publicly discuss and to understand and then we will seek to investigate ways to improve um, our overall carbon footprint over time. And that includes also how we operate our business, how we operate, operate our buildings um, and people um, uh, activities that we have. So, so it's, created, it's created a debate, which I think is really, really helpful. Um, and there's some numbers in there that I think it's useful for us to keep an eye on as time goes on. And as I say, I hope that we've led by example and um, other institutions will, will do similar uh, disclosures in the very near future. Pippa, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think, I think it's great that the BOE is, is trying to lead by example, as you say. Uh, you know, the government is doing that. The central bank is following suit. That's fantastic. So, you know, now you've done the analysis, are you going to use it for action going forward? Will you make like TCFD... Uh, minimums, a criteria for, for bond investment, for example? Well, let, let me come back to Ben, because uh, it's 2% of the portfolio, and it's, uh, I, can, I, can, I can see the argument for making it across the market, uh, but Ben may have a different view. He may feel that this ought to be targeted. Ben? Uh, well, I mean, it's, you know, so this is obviously the bank should be commended for this. I did think when they announced that they were going to do it, it was going to put them in a tricky position because of their guilt position, right? <laughs> so, okay, you're going to do a warming potential assessment of your portfolio. Most of your portfolio is guilt. That means you're going to be assessing sovereign risk exposure to climate change. Um, and you're then basically in the position of assessing whether you think government policy um, is is fit for purpose across the economy to deliver on a particular warming target. Uh, the bank, that would obviously put the bank in quite an awkward position. So I can see why they've sidestepped that <laughs> completely by focusing on 
the corporate bond portfolio. However, um, other investors, of course, will have to, you know, will, I think we'll have to look at that and we'll have to look at other sovereigns as well. And so that's something that we've seen more of, um, I'd say, in the last quarter, uh, the last the half year, in fact, um, more and more interest in sovereign risk um, and how that tr- links to bond portfolios. One of the bits of news we had uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday was a, a, a really innovative court case from Australia. So a 23-year-old student filed uh, an action against the Australian government, um, basically going, look, in, when you've been selling uh, government bonds, Australian government bonds, you have not disclosed your climate risk exposure, and you should do, and that's a, you know, and, uh, consequently there might be losses associated with it. Um, so that's an example of this debate kind of hotting up quite significantly on the, on the sovereign exposure. Pepper or, or, or Chris, do either of you have a view on that? Pepper, so I can, I can, I can go with that. So, so I think, uh, I think one of the really important things to build into any analysis of a portfolio warming metric is the transition Um, and the extent that a transition is going to be successful and the extent to which a transition is going to allow us to meet goals by a certain date, say 2050. As the the UK sets out what its uh, transition plan is to get to 2050, I would expect that to be reflected in a portfolio warming value um, for the UK sovereign. Now, at, at the moment, if you were to do an analysis of, um, of the UK, I don't think you'd have all the facts because we haven't got full, uh, full visibility of the, of the plan yet. So, so I think next year we will have a much better opportunity to look at uh, what the UK's um, portfolio warming um, metrics would be, but but we I mean we should fool ourselves. If you if you look at if, if you if you uh, look across the globe uh, at all uh, all states, I think all of them are going to be significantly higher than the the two percent that we um, that we aspire to. Um, so so we should benchmark against the two percent for sure. That is the target. But we should also benchmark countries against each other to make sure that they're all chiving each other to um, to move as quickly as possible, and we're using the best examples of countries to move others as quickly as possible. I, I, think, I think depending on yeah. how, you know, what you're kind of arguing about is how we're measuring this, how we're analysing this. And, you know, that's very important without measuring and tracking. Of course, we can't, can't see that, that progress and can't evaluate what the financial risk is. But, you know, the underlying issue is here, as the student in Australia has said, is that, you know, governments have been dragging their feet over, over climate action and are still moving far too slowly. And historically, they had the kind of get out that they thought this was going to cost us money. And, you know, increasingly over the last few years, we've seen, you know, uh, asset holder after asset holder, report after report coming back and saying it will save us money. And nowhere is that clearer than, than in the UK, where we are underwriting our own health system and our own welfare state to say, like, it will save us money to make this transition happen. And so it's, it is very frustrating, I, I can imagine, for you know, lay people like this student to see governments still, like, just hedging and measuring and analyzing and making excuses when, when you know, what we really want to see is like, why is the government not taking more action? They're still acting like we think this is going to cost us money, not it's going to save us money as well as being the right thing to do. Ben, back to you. Yeah, I mean, I think in the UK context, one interesting piece of work that's underway is from the Office for Budget Responsibility, which um, is looking at uh, how climate change um, and the transition that's underway could affect could affect the tax take in different ways over the short term, but also over the longer term. You know, with electric vehicles, what do we do with that fuel duty, um, and so on and so forth? Those are really important fiscal questions. Um, there's also something else that's going to be coming out later this or interim report coming out later this year in autumn, and then a full report in the spring, which was confirmed yesterday. I think I saw, which is the Treasury has been doing something called the Net Zero Review which is basically, again, looking at the, the implications, costs, benefits for different bits of the economy, different bits of the UK from the transition to net zero. So, who, you know, who are the winners going to be? Who are the losers? What are the things we need to do in particular to support a just transition? Um, and that all gets links you back to the sustainability of all of this from a, a fiscal economic perspective. So, Chris, again, we're going to see more of that. Chris, do you have a view on the OBR or the Treasury, Treasury reviews? The OBR, of course, is, is a notionally independent body. Uh, I don't know how, how well-funded this particular review will be, but the OBR and the Treasury. 
Yeah. So, so I think the treasury review is really, really important because it's the it's the point where um, flesh is put onto the bones of how the UK is going to get to. Well, in theory, it's the point where flesh is put onto the bones on how the UK is going to get to its twenty fifty its twenty fifty target. So, I think there's a there's a lot of attention on that. A lot of people are waiting to see what the the tangible policy responses will be and we've had some colour on what those responses might look like and we've seen some we've seen some recent positive developments such as the the Chancellor's um, announcement a couple of weeks ago on um, on housing and and the subsidies for making um, uh, houses more environmentally uh, uh, friendly um, but but what we really need to see is a is a complete package and some analysis that, that uh, links the the package of actions to the gap that needs to be filled and the speed at which that gap needs to be filled. And to go to um, to, to respond to Pippa's point, I, I, I 100% agree because um, there's a lot of frustration that we're not seeing action. And every single year that we don't see action is a big deal because the carbon is building up in the atmosphere and it's just going to mean that we're backloading the, the issue to, to later years. So, so we've, got, we've got to move very, very quickly. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I, I would hope that the HNT review, but also um, the, the, the catalyst of COP, which will be in the UK this year, will act together to mean that we have clarity um, within, uh, within 2020. I think I think that will help. But, you know, I mean, obviously, you guys are used to looking at things purely in economic terms, like how is this going to impact our tax take? It's really interesting to think of it that way for, for me. Um, but, you know, we, we should also be looking at it in terms of our carbon budget, which we've been measuring for years and looking at for years. And the Committee on Climate Change, another nominally independent body, has just put forward the most scathing report to say we are nowhere near hitting our targets, absolutely nowhere near. And we can stand up and say, right, we're legally binding targets 2050 net zero. And that's wonderful. But, uh, you know, and until we actually start acting and like embodying that glide path to, to those targets, it's just targets. And, um, you know, the, the Committee on Climate Change have just published their annual progress report saying, I don't know if you covered this in last month's one, so, saying like we're nowhere near hitting this target. And um, actually, you know, all of, every single Whitehall department needs to start preparing for two degree plus warming. Um, and you know that that's 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 you know, to say to stand up and say that um, you know we've made legally binding targets and that somehow gives us um, you know some grace period. It, it doesn't. You know we we just they've been suggesting policies and um, you know a robust carbon budget for for years and we're we're just failing to to act on it. Okay, back to you, Ben. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think that's a bit unfair on the government and what it's been doing and the, the actual state of the situation in relation to the current and subsequent carbon budgets, right? I think that the point is that we need to make significant deep investments to achieve um, future carbon budgets, but we have met the current one and, and, and we'll look set to meet the next five-year one. It's the ones afterwards which are really difficult, um, where you have to basically you know, decarbonize heat and we don't yet know exactly how we're going to do that. Um, so, you know, what, what the CCC is talking about is stuff that is 10, 15, 20 years out that does require some thought and investment, lots of it right now. But um, we, we are making massive progress on the carbon budgets that we have, they said, over a five year period. Right. So um, credit where credit's due, I think. Um, but look, on, on moving back to kind of the, the supervisory work, there are a couple of other things I wanted to mention. One is um, there's uh, mental, we've talked about this at length at other meetings, something called the Central Banks and Supervisors Network for Greening the Financial System, the NGFS. There are a couple of big NGFS publications that came out last month, one of which I know the UK has been very, very involved in. Um, so I just wanted to give Chris an opportunity to talk, talk about those briefly. Chris, talk about them briefly. Thank you. So, so, I, so if we're going to bend the carbon curve, um, we need to take bottom, bottom up and top down action. And one of the ways that we can do the bottom up action is to ensure that every single firm that operates in the country um, and beyond understands what their, um, what their carbon um, risks and opportunities will look like. But one of the issues that we have in doing that is that uh, the best tool for understanding these things is scenario analysis. And 
Um, there are a lot of climate scenarios out there, but they all have um, different caveats or they um, are focused towards one type of scenario rather than another. What we thought there was a real need for was a set of scenarios that was created on an independent basis um, that could be used in an open source way across uh, firms, central banks, governments. Um, and that's what the NGFS has done. So the, the NGFS, which is a group of um, over 60 central banks, has come together and it's developed a, uh, a number of climate scenarios that stretch um, beyond 30 years. And um, it's done that in conjunction with the best climate scientists and it's, and it's published those. Um, now, they're, they're pretty high level because um, uh, there's going to be a couple of stages to this. So, what, so what's been published now is kind of the shape of uh, there's eight scenarios and three anchor scenarios that we suggest people people use, um, but they will be iterate, iterated over time, and we hope that that will create consistency across across um, uh, firm firms analysis. and And this is really really important because one, it allows firms to understand their risks as they develop over time. Two, it allows them to understand the opportunities in this over time. But three. For the external observers of firms, for those who want to invest in firms, um, they want something that's comparable and they want something that they understand. And our hope is that by having a scenario that can be used in a consistent way, um, it's not going to be riddled with lots of secret little judgments that make um, one result maybe look more amenable to a firm than, than another. So consistency and disclosure is really, really important in this space. And we, and we hope it moves it forward and, and and hopefully um pippa in your world as you're looking across firms you might see more use of um these uh these kind of anchor scenarios across across firms but i think it's early days so um we'll have to see how what the take up's like anchor scenarios pippa are you impressed or do you feel this is uh, not enough i mean i'm not sure i'm not i'm not familiar with with these scenarios um are they similar to the ipcc scenarios yeah, there's, there's, there's similar. There's there's three main scenarios. There's there's one that says you do an orderly transition um, that starts today. Um, there's another that says it's a disorderly transition, so you wait ten years and then you do a whole load of action to try and bend the curve. And there's one that says you don't do any transition at all and you just build up physical risks and take massive hits on the on the back of it. So by doing those, we try to we try to bookmark the different types of impact that we could see. Now, then there's those are different scenarios and those are different judgments that you can use. But, um, but we hope that those would be a, um, a, a, a good benchmarking device for, uh, for firms across the real economy and the financial sector. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm more familiar with the, the scenarios in the, the um, IPCC reports, which talk about, yes, different scenarios as to, to how quickly the world is going to be warming and how quickly we, you know, in relation to how quickly we manage to cut emissions. So I, I guess they might um, have some, some mapping across uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of the companies I'm working with are at a very early stage and they are working more generally on a principle of, you know, if we can create technology innovation that makes this trend, makes, makes the tr zero carbon uh, energy and um, economy more cheaper and better, then we will transition faster. Um, and I think the, the kind of nitty gritty of, you know, what big business is going to do is probably out of the, the reach of, of most of those small entrepreneurs. It's just more working upon the, the principle of, you know, like I said, using technology to, to make innovation happen and to make um, these solutions cheaper and better. And hopefully that will speed their adoption. OK, Ben, back to you. Yeah, so two, sort of the last two things on supervision now, one kind of quite positive or very positive, the other less so. Um, the good news comes from Singapore and the Monetary Authority of Singapore that's announced a consultation, basically taking a lot of the key bits of the Bank of England's supervisory expectations for banks and insurers, but applying them to banks, insurers and asset managers, and also broadening it out not, so it's not just climate risk; it's also it's broader environment-related risks, um, and I think this is a, this is a good thing in, in terms of you know other jurisdictions are looking at what the BOE has said on on supervisor expectations and, uh, and adopting it, and I, and that's because it's really sensible. So that's that's good news. Um, the Singaporeans have also Singapore is always a leader in you know what Singapore does first, everybody else does second. Sorry. 
Well, it's the other way around, I think, in this case. So, you know, well, give, give... Singapore validates what we've done. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But they've also gone gangbusters on on trying to make Singapore uh, a sustainable finance hub in all sorts of ways. So I've been hearing things, you know, like, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a very significant rebate or subsidy for anyone that does a green finance qualification in Singapore. Um, uh, and th- these include green finance qualifications offered by UK based um, green well, finance professions, sorry, offering green finance qualifications. Um, they're also offering subsidies for, um, you know, sustain, sustainable finance analysts and team members to be based in Singapore and so on and so forth. Like they're really, really going for it, which is very interesting to see. Um, the, Chris, is that a, do you feel that's a threat to the UK? I mean, looking at it from the city's point of view? So, so um, I would say, I would say not at all. Um, so I, I was actually just talking to the Singaporean um, uh, Central Bank uh, the other day and I, I agree. They're doing fantastic, fantastic stuff. Look, there's there's enough capacity in the global market to have a, a significant um, increases in the green bond market and other green finance happening in Singapore and London. There's the, there's the demand out there, so I don't I don't think there's any real problem to London in this in this regard. If anything, I think it's a it's a shot across London's bow, bows to um, to to step its step its game up. Because whilst, whilst London is um, home to lots of institutions that talk a good game on green, um, and it does issue a number of uh, uh, green bonds, I think it's the, one of the largest issuing hubs for, for green bonds. Actually, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of um, UK companies that are issuing green bonds, and there's a lot of lessons that we can take from abroad. So uh, we'll be watching Singapore, Singapore closely, and I personally will be encouraging them and hoping they do a great job. Back to you, Ben. Uh, and then something from the US that was less good. Um, the Department of Labor in the US has proposed a change to um, the rules around private pensions and their administration basically saying that if you, if you do anything that's ESG orientated, you need to prove that you're not in any way sacrificing financial returns. Um, so basically the burden to justify picking ESG related investment strategies becomes much higher. I don't think for a second it's going to be particularly difficult for um, scheme administrators to prove that you aren't sacrificing financial returns because they won't be. Um, But it just adds that extra burden. Um, And I think a lot of people, particularly in the asset management industry in the US, are worried that if that rule goes through, then it will dampen demand and interest in sustainable finance in the US. It's the Department of Labor rule, is it? And where does it stand? You say, who has to approve it? Does does it go straight to the president? Is it an an administrative rule? You you know what? I I, I don't know. I think it's an administrative rule. I mean, there are many pension organisations, um, and I'm curious to know whether the jurisdiction of the Department of Labour extends that far. I mean, Chris, do you have a view on it? I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a view on that. Uh, I, I don't think it's out of out of sync with some of the other stuff that we've seen from from US. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We watch we watch international events um, quite closely, and we and we discuss uh, climate with the Fed. Quite um, uh, like as part of uh, natural uh, natural discourse with with a whole load of other things. You know, I, I think um, you know I think events are unfolding quite quite quickly there. But um, with the election coming in November, we're also looking at what um, the new uh, administration might be looking to do. So there's lots of moving lots of moving parts here in the climate space. Well, Ben. Um Biden does have a, a new green green program out. I think two weeks ago. I don't know if Ben has views on that. Uh, so, by the way, just it's the ARESA plans, Employee Oops. Retirement Income Security Act plans. Um, yeah, a massive uh, uh, announcement from Biden, the Biden campaign: two trillion uh, to be invested in clean energy, the, the net zero transition, um, decarbonizing the electricity system in the US by 2035 and so on and so forth. But obviously depends a lot entirely on the election and, and majorities in the House and the Senate. So we'll, uh, we'll see. But that's a, that's a big, big change in 
potentially in what what the federal government's doing. Pippa, do you have a view on on Biden's Biden's energy program? You know, I, I, I lived in the US through the last election, so I, I no longer have a, a view on, I no, I no longer try and call elections. Um, yes, uh, I mean, obviously, Biden's plans, he's got some fantastic people on his team. Um, you know, he's, they, all, they all make sense and they're all great plans and would love to have a chance to see him, you know, rescinding a lot of the damage that has been done by the current administration across the board, not in the least in the, the area of, um, you know, of pensions and um, in the, the EPA being eviscerated, RPE, you know, it's, it's, been, um, it's been a bad, bad four years um, in terms of environmental protections. Uh, and, you know, it's encouraging to see some of the, the states and cities and not in the least the multinational corporates who are largely now, you know, the biggest companies in the world based based in the US, um, that they are not paying really much attention to what the current administration is saying and, and doing their own thing and doing the right thing, uh, you know, from the perspective of, of this conversation um, with, with their pensions, with their, um, their, their net zero targets and actions. And, you know, so hopefully uh, that will limit the, the damage that the current administration can cause. And yes, let's hope that, that the change is run through in November. But of course, I mean, as Ben says, it doesn't just need a change in the White House, it needs a change in the Senate. Yeah. Yes. And that, I guess, is um, still only probably a one in three chance. But Ben, uh, continue with your agenda. Yeah. So um, moving on to uh, a neighbor, so Canada. Um, some interesting work from colleagues uh, working as part of the Canada Climate Law Initiative. Um, which is a collaboration between the University of British Columbia and New York University. Um, and they've published, they've got uh, Hansel, the law firm, to publish a or produce a legal opinion looking at climate risk and director's duties, basically saying, look, if you're a, a director of a Canadian company, then you are obliged to address and report on climate risk. And there's precedent in, in Canadian law. Um, you know, this is just another a legal opinion that reinforces this in a number of different jurisdictions, particularly um, common law jurisdictions, although Canada obviously is common and civil law. Um, but for those watching in Canada, very interesting. I recommend you have a look at it. Continue. Okay, so China, um, in the news for a bunch of different reasons, um, two, two things to flag. Uh, there was, so there's, there's an NGO called the Global Energy Monitor, that um, does kind of says what it's does what it says on the tin, which is track in particular new fossil investments in different bits of the world. They published a bit of analysis saying that um, China is planning to increase its coal fired capacity at the fastest rate since 2015. There are now 40 gigawatts of new coal plants planned, um, which is about the same size as the entire existing fleet um, in South Africa. South Africa being a big user of coal. Um, and obviously, this is this is completely incompatible with with climate change. Um, you then also have uh, Belt and Road countries. So, the, I mean, you could argue that most countries are Belt and Road countries, right? But um, uh, a lot of Belt and Road countries, particularly ones that have had and have issues with foreign currency exchange, um, like Pakistan and Indonesia. Quite a few of these countries have kind of, with COVID, have gone. Oh, hang on, we kind of need to. We probably need to reconsider how we repay and um, repay these loans, and a lot of these loans are tied to energy projects, particularly coal projects. So there's this sort of domestic story in China around coal, and then there's this broader international Belt and Road story as well that's kind of been shaken up a bit by a lot by COVID. Um, and it seems to be that you've got this domestic pressure to do more coal, which is crazy, and then you've got BRI countries going, "Oh, cranky, we can't afford." The existing loans that we've taken. So this is, I think, this is going to. This is a major story for climate um, and for finance. Uh, we, but very interesting to see how that's that's going to pan out. We did have a, a video with Danny Alexander, who is the um, executive vice president at the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, arguing earlier this week that um, that the AIIB. Has no uh, has no fossil fuel pro projects in its pipeline, despite the fact that it's obviously dominated by China. So I would assume that's a plus, even if the Belt and Road Initiative itself is not. But Pippa, do you have a view on on China and the B BRI? 
Yeah, I mean that 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 is scary stuff, isn't it? They have they have a lot of power there, and um, you know it sounds like they're they're tying it to continuation of coal. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because you know without China, we wouldn't currently have solar being the cheapest form of energy on the planet. Um, and you know, in, in, we've seen a lot of uh, coal coal and um, other fossil power generation being turned off during the energy dip of COVID because because the marginal cost of solar and wind is 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 free. So, you know, there's, there's been a lot of good news on that recently. Um, and, you know, the, the economics of this just are irrefutable. So, you know, it's, it's a shame to see that, that China is still defying those, those kind of laws of economics, um, I guess, because they have a ton of, or access to a ton of cheap coal. Uh, but, you know, I think inevitably it will have to start declining as, you know, the, so the, the economic powers behind it, like the, the insurance companies, the loans, the, the, the financing bodies um, turn against it. Chris, I mean, I assume this is a little bit difficult for the Bank of England to take a view on, but do you have a thoughts on China? So, so it's interesting when you look at the, the coal investment industry over the last couple of years. So, uh, a lot of a lot of global financial firms said that they were no good, that they were not going to invest in coal any any longer, um, and it was kind of easy for them to do that because it represented a quite small part of their overall um, their overall business. Now, I should say, not all firms did that. There's some some quite large international banks that are still investing in coal. What we've what we've seen is that uh, China has stepped in to invest in coal where that private sector investment wouldn't uh, necessarily be securable any, anymore. And there is, a real, there is a real question here about what the trajectory is for, for coal um, and what the innovation uh, trajectory looks like that could offset that. Um, the, the, the latest analysis that I've seen um, gives very contrasting views. So, so I've, one piece of analysis has suggested that over the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, we could see quite a dampening of the need for coal as other innovative technologies take over. But then you get, you get another piece of analysis that says something totally different. So, so we just don't know. But, but when you do look at the investment that you need to make in a, a coal part, coal plant you're looking at that coal plant being in operation for say 20 30 years so so it is really really concerning from a, a global carbon perspective that um, uh, that new coal infrastructure is still being built because it means that for the next decades um, there is uh, an ambition to uh, maintain the, the at least the current level of activity I think and back to you yeah, I mean, the other thing to, to flag is, you know, is the, is the role of public finance uh, in all of this. And it's hard to disentangle that in the story of the Belt and Road. Um, there's going to be a massive summit in November this year held in Paris, organized um, with the French government called Finance in Common, which is going to be the largest such summit involving public finance, financial institutions, um, particularly DFI's development finance institutions. Um, to focus on climate change. And uh, the biggest DFI is um, the China Development Bank, which um, dwarfs all the other DFIs combined. I mean, it's just a massive provider of capital for these things. So we, we won't be able to sort this out unless Chinese public financial institutions get a handle on it. Um, okay, moving on. So for something completely different, maybe this is as far, far away from public finance as you can get, is hedge funds. Um, so the increasing sort of chatter about the hedge fund industry getting more involved in sustainable finance, ESG, there was a bit of coverage in the FT about Marshall Waste, which is a big European hedge fund announcing a, a, a £1 billion fund. Um, but I've been hearing through the grapevine various other, other things. That's, that's kind of interesting. I don't know whether others have heard about those developments. Well, this is Pippo. This is your area. Pippo, how do you feel? The wilder fringes of uh, private finance. I mean, we're, we're at the the... The very smaller earlier stage than uh, than most of these kind of giant hedge funds, but no, it's 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 very encouraging to see um, so many large funds focused on specifically on climate that have been announced you know, d even during like the COVID period. You know that the people have been leaning in, not not backing away, and realizing how important it is that the recovery 
uh, you know, is, a, is, is used as a spur for, for green growth and that however bad COVID has been for, for the world's economies, um, climate change is, is just around the corner and it's, it's going to be orders of magnitude worse. So it's, it's, it's reassuring to see that people are keeping a focus on that um, and good to see that some of the, the, the bigger funds and the kind of more um, conservative financial bodies like the hedge funds are um, coming around to the, the idea that ESG G investing is, is, you know, is critical to have that filter upon everything they're doing and that actually that will help them to get better results. Well, I don't know if Chris has a view on this, but you know, it's always good to see people uh, rich folk risk their money in, in morally less dubious areas. I mean, I hope they lose some of it, but um, at least there will be something to show at the end of it. Chris? The, the, the only thing I'll add to that, and this is, this is less of my patch than the, um, than the previous discussion, is that uh, what's really positive about this is that in order to make these ESG investments, um, what you're seeing in hedge funds and other institutions is that they're building up their own toolkit for how they understand ESG. Because um, because all of the data is not out there, um, and particularly in the SME market, the fast growing SME market, where they would be particularly interested, you, you don't have a lot of data there at all. What you're seeing is um, a lot of capacity being built up, and once uh, once you invest in that capacity, it's um, it's there in your organisation, and you can iterate it, and you can um, you can invest in it in a, in a more in a more sort of bespoke way. So I think I think what we're seeing is um, some heavy lifting happening in uh, in the investor community that's going to really pay off in the in the future, and we really do hope it pays off in that in that smaller kind of more startup uh, part of the economy where so much of the activity and so much of the promise uh, sits. Ben. So another bit of the system, I, big US banks, so Morgan Stanley, the first big bank to do this in the US, has said it's going to disclose, measure and disclose its uh, scope three emissions. So looking at the emissions associated with its its loans and investments, um, lots of other banks in Europe have made those commitments, but they're the first big US one, a um, bit of progress. Um, we've also had, uh, and we're going to hear much more about this, and we talked about it a bit at the beginning, um, but the Carbon Disclosure Project launched a new temperature rating system for investors. Um, this was launched in early July. Um, and it, you know, all sorts of methodological questions, as we talked about before, with how the bank was doing its, its warming potential analysis for its, its corporate bond portfolio. Um, but this will be the start of much, much more of this becoming public. Um, and there are various groups that are working on this, including a group that's been set up by the TCFD Secretariat that's run, that's run well, by well, David Blood. The aim is to give what, what information? So this, basically this implied temperature rise associated with the portfolio. So the idea is that you go, okay, well, this portfolio has got implied temperature rise of four degrees. This one's got an implied temperature rise of two and a half, and therefore the one with two and a half is, is taking more action on climate change, and that's how we're going to compare them. That's the idea. Um, Chris, does, is this plausible to you? This this is very plausible, and this is a this is a really really positive move. But I would I, I would caveat that positive uh, that positive um, view with two things. The, the, the first one is there's a lot of different portfolio warming metrics um, provided by different companies out there, um, and they're not always going to be comparable. So so we need to. We need to create a way to make them more more comparable. Um, and the, the 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 second one is that at at a point in time when they are comparable, what I think would be unfortunate is if there's a black box that sits um, at the centre of this calculation and provides a portfolio warming uh, calculation. I think what people really need to know is if if a company is on track for a three and a half degree. Um, is aligned with the three and a half degree increase in temperature by 2100. Um, what does that actually mean? What assumptions have been made? What assumptions have been made around carbon capture and technological development elsewhere? So, so really what I would advocate is uh, much more use of portfolio warming metrics. They're a great thing and they're nice and easy to sort of understand. So 
they, they can be uh, popularized quite easily, but also transparency. Let's understand exactly what's in there and what judgments have been made because there are necessarily a whole load of judgments. Against okay, we've only got five minutes left. What's, what's next on your agenda, Ben? Oh, well, lots of things. We never get through everything. I mean, one other thing that's been announced um, is a, a joint thing between the TCFD and the London Stock Exchange um, and the CEO of the London Stock Exchange, David Schwimmer and Mark Carney, I think in his capacity as being involved in the TCFD, um, wrote letters to different London, uh, sorry, different stock exchanges asking them to participate in a new initiative designed to try and basically promote and encourage effective TCFD um, implementation amongst listed companies. So that's something that's going to get more, more attention. Um, we've had some interesting examples of investor engagement over the last month. Um, there was a story uh, in Reuters about how um, institutional investors had clubbed together to engage with the Brazilian government on deforestation on forest fires in the Amazon. Um, is a slightly, I'm not sure the, the headline was quite accurate. Brazil bans fires in Amazon as investors demand results. So I'm not sure they, there's, there's still fires going on, not completely banned. But anyway, you know, investors not just doing shareholder resolutions, but also engaging with governments, very important. We then had some sort of UK news. There was uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, um, who's the Minister for Climate Change, um, was saying that the government is actively planning to create a new green investment bank, a GIB Mark II. I was quite involved in GIB Mark I, and there are lots of easy lessons we could learn about that, that cock up. <laughs> um, uh, and then you've got... Well, there are let, let me ask Chris on, on GIB Mark II. I mean, do you have a, a, a view on that? Because it's obviously it would be a big step, big step forward or backwards, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, suppose I, I don't know the details on it. I mean, of course, it sounds very positive. Um, and um, if it's set up in the right way, it can absolutely advance um, the investments that we need to see. But um, I'd like to see the details before I uh, make any, any more detailed comments myself. Back to you, Ben. Um, we had some positive news from CDC, which is the UK's DFI. Um, this is uh, Commonwealth Development Corporation, although I think they've just changed it to CDC now, saying that they're going to end fossil fuel financing. Um, you know, they're they're mainly investing in developing countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, so they've come up with a strategy that's really positive, that's sort of counteracted by other news this month um, that I'm not sure has been yet 100% confirmed, but there are a few stories looking at uh, UK export finance, which looks like it might be backing a big loan to Total to create a massive $15 billion LNG facility in Mozambique, which probably isn't aligned with um, the government's climate objectives. So you've got this kind of CDC doing one thing and then UK Export Finance possibly doing another. And then another thing that's sort of related to the UK but is positive is uh, two days ago, the UK together with the Swiss um, and 10 large financial institution, institutions initiated the task force on nature-related financial disclosures. So they set up a, a working group. The TNFD will begin um, or will land, I think, next year. This was something that was originally mentioned in the UK Green Finance Strategy that came out in 2019. Um, all very positive. Uh, I'm, as we've discussed on other on other webinars, other meetings. You know, there there is a limit to what disclosure can do in terms of actually changing the world. However, in this case, the fact that we're so far behind on biodiversity and nature in financial decision making, the fact that this will foreground that significantly and get people to really start thinking about it, I think is a really very significant development. So well done to the people involved in getting that getting that going. Hey, let me just ask Pippa and Chris what we've missed or what they think we've missed. Pippa, what have we missed this month? Nature related financial disclosure. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that, that that came up. Um, yeah, as you say, really positive um, analysis. Um, and kind of relating to a previous um, uh, point you were making, that there's, there was the, the International Association for Sustainable Economics has done an analysis of corporate reporting frameworks, which I think is something we've been talking about a lot 
today um, and looking at all the different reporting requirements across all the different company countries and, and companies. Um, and as ESG disclosure becomes more mainstream, how important it is to start having some of those you know, stand, common standards and the, the transparency, which I think has you know, been a, a, a common theme for, for what we're talking about today. Chris, what have we missed? So uh, I think that I think that was pretty thorough from from Ben to be honest. I mean, I say so there's the the, the increasing um, increasingly regular positive announcements coming out of the ECB um, about how they want to um, position themselves as a central bank and the importance that they're going to place on climate. Um, and I guess the the, the, the one thing that um, hasn't really come up very much today is just the impact on of COVID on our ability to keep um, a climate gender going um, and the extent to which it's sucking the air onto the room. And my, my take on this, other people might have a different view, is that actually it's been refreshingly, um, uh, it refreshingly hasn't sucked the air out of the room on climate. In fact, I think it's motivated people to continue going. We'll, we'll see what happens at the government level and other, and other areas uh, in terms of policy making as it develops. But to date, I think it's just motivated people rather than uh, made them step back. At least if you've still got a job. The final word is with you, um, Ben. What are you looking at over the next month? Well, hopefully a holiday, I think. That's the main thing. Been a holiday. <laughs> I think it's a, a holiday, holiday in August. Uh, hopefully deserved. Uh, yeah, so that's really the main thing. And then, you know, getting, getting energised for September. Um, and as you know, I'm quite involved in the COP26 work in the Cabinet Office, and that's going to take up a lot of time over the next 18 months. But we all need to recharge the batteries and then hit the ground running in September. Great. We'll all recharge our batteries and hit the ground running, but uh, some of us will be laboring on through August, I think. Can I thank you, Ben, as always? Can I thank Pippa and Chris? And thank all of you for watching. Many, many thanks.